Okay, well, thank you. We'll go ahead and get started uh, on this beautiful evening. Uh, good evening and welcome to Making Michigan. This is the Bentley Historical Libraries series on the history of the University of Michigan. I'm Gary Krenz, the director of the Judy and Stanley Frankel uh, Observatory, where we are now, the Detroit Observatory. Uh, and the uh, Detroit Observatory is a division of the, of the Bentley. I'm pleased to welcome those of you in the room. Thanks for coming. And our, and our audience online on YouTube. Uh, before we get started, I just want to take one moment uh, simply to acknowledge the great amount of pain and suffering uh, that we're seeing around the world at this time in places like Maui, Libya, Greece, Ukraine, Sudan, and many other places. These and other things make for a very overwhelming age in which we're living. Uh, but, you know, time and again, human beings have shown that they have a great capacity to help others, and I know that we will all do our best to help where we can. The focus of tonight's talk is certainly someone who exemplified that spirit. Our topic is A City's Conscience, The Life and Career of Josephine Goman, and I'm very happy to welcome my colleague at the Bentley, Michelle McClellan. I greatly appreciate her joining tonight. Michelle is the Johanna Meyer Magoon Principal Archivist at the Bentley Historical Library. She serves as the field archivist for Michigan Historical Collections, aiming to preserve diverse stories from across the state. Michelle earned her PhD in American History from Stanford University and her MSI from the University of Michigan. Before joining the Bentley, Michelle worked in academia, museums, and historic preservation. She has published on the history of women in medicine, including the book Lady Lush's Gender, Alcoholism, and Medicine in Modern America. She has also written on Little House Heritage Tourism. That's as in Little House on the Prairie, not small houses, although that, those, are, those are overlapping sets, right? So I mean, it's... A, uh, and, how, and also on how museums and historic sites can highlight formerly hidden stories. Most recently, she co-authored Not Even Past, Archiving 2020 in Real Time with April McKay, and that appeared in the volume Being Human During COVID-19, which is available from University of Michigan Press. And I might add, as the former director of the university's bicentennial, that Michelle was part of the team that organized the LSA theme semesters, which were such a huge contribution to the bicentennial, and that in many respects are an inspiration for what we try to do here at the observatory. Uh, and as the director of the observatory, I have appreciated her advice and counsel. Please join me in welcoming Michelle. Thank you, Gary, very much for that introduction. And I am very glad to be here and to have the opportunity to talk about women's history and specifically Josephine Goman. And I'm not sure how she pronounced her name, actually, so sometimes I try to say Goman, Goman. Um, I'm just not sure because we have not heard her voice, at least not yet. Um, so first I want to ask, how many people have heard of her? OK. Um, which is kind of not a big surprise, actually. So I first met her, as I think of it, through the book by Kevin Boyle, Arc of Justice, that talked about the, the trial of Dr. Asayan Sweet in Detroit in the 1920s. Now, Sweet and his wife Gladys brought, bought a home on the east side of Detroit in 1925 in a white neighborhood. When they moved in, a mob of white people came outside the building and threatened them, throwing rocks, bottles, night after night. The Sweets and some of their friends were inside the house. A shot was fired from outside the house, killed somebody in the mob, and the Sweets and their friends were put on trial for murder. The NAACP defended Sweet and brought in Clarence Darrow to defend him, um, who had, was fresh off the Scopes monkey trial, so was a very, very well-known attorney. The judge in that case was Frank Murphy. Um, now, Murphy went on to become governor of Michigan, governor general of the Philippines, mayor of the city of Detroit, U.S. Supreme Court justice. I mean, he looms very large. And part of the reason we, the, those who know of Goman, sometimes know of her because of her association with Murphy. So that, again, that's how I met her, as I literally think of it, was through this book, because she, she attended the trial. 
But I started to think about this woman who appears just on just a few pages of, of Boyle's book who really kind of intrigued me. And I thought, why is she not better known? Or why, have I, why don't I know more about her? What is there to know? What could be known about her? And that's what inspired me to really learn more about her. And that's why I'm here to share some of this with you today. So uh, uh, as Gary said, I'm a historian and an archivist. And that means I spend a lot of my time thinking about the past about what we know about the past and about how we know it. What kinds of materials have survived that we can look at to learn about the past. So I also, I'm going to talk about Goldman quite a bit, but I also want to take a minute to talk to you a little bit about the Bentley Historical Library. Um, now how many of you have been to the Bentley? Now some in the audience, wow, pretty close, not quite, okay. For those, of you, for those of you watching from home, Almost everybody in the room raised their hands. Now, some of them are my Bentley colleagues who kindly came, but other folks too. Um, so, that, so that's great. But I'm still going to give a little bit of an overview about the Bentley for those maybe watching who have not been there. So the Bentley is both the archive of the University of Michigan and it preserves, preserves material related to the state of Michigan, the history of the state. And that's what I do. I'm the field archivist. I work to collect that material about the history of the state. And so we like to say the Bentley is where Michigan's history lives. And I'm going to just give you a snapshot about its size and scope. We have 12,000 different collections, 75,000 linear feet of primary source material. That's how archivists measure by the foot, 75,000 linear feet, 136 terabytes of digital material. I don't even know exactly what that means, but I know it's a lot, OK? 10,000 maps. 80,000 printed volumes, 1.5 million photos. So there's a lot. There's a, a rich variety of material. And I'm going to come back to the Bentley and tell you a little bit more about that later. But back to Josephine Gaumont. So this is, a, this is a timeline of her life. Historians, we love timelines. It just gives us a sense of the chronology here. And I'm going to talk about each of these different phases, but I think it's good to see the line as a whole. Look at those dates. 1892, there's a little bit of, of discrepancy of exactly when she was born, but basically 1890, 91, or 92, to 1975. So a long life, but also living through some of really the major defining events of the 20th century, right? Um, so I want you to have that sort of in the back of your mind as, as we go on. So she was an only child. She was born right here in Ann Arbor. She lived in a, a kind of economically precarious family. Her father seemed to be a laborer. They moved around a fair bit, not a lot of security, um, at least not economically. She attended the University of Michigan beginning in 1909. Now, not that many people went to college at that time. Not that many people even graduated from high school at that time. So she's already kind of unusual in that way. And at the time that she attended the university, about one in five were women. So she's kind of an outsider in a number of ways. She said, I went with no plans for the future and came out the same way. Now, many students then and now <laughs> may sort of say something like that. But she also said, my interest was in absorbing knowledge and I was indiscriminate in what kind. So here is, um, this is not her, <laughs> unfortunately, but it, 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 on the, so on the, I guess on your right is a photo of a, or an image of the campus at around the time she attended. And then the image on your left is of a woman phone operator, you know, ch changing, hook, connect, literally connecting people. And I put that up there because to put herself through school, she had to work the overnight shift on the phone exchange seven days per week. So that's what she did every night. She went and worked that exchange, um, not that far from where we are right now, probably, kind of up over in that area in a building that's no longer standing. Um, this grueling work routine shaped her course of study. She considered several different majors that required a lot of lab time. She started in the College of Engineering, but was not able to sustain that because of the number of hours she would have had to work um, in labs. So she ultimately went to the Literary College, LSNA, as we call it today, um, and also did some education courses. She met Frank Murphy while she was a student here at U of M. It's possible they met at Mass. Um, we don't know for sure how they met, but they met as students. In her last semester, she got a scholarship. 
She got to know a very supportive English professor who connected her with a scholarship, so she did not have to do that work anymore just for that very last semester. She wound up uh, writing a little bit for the Michigan Daily. And so this, as you can imagine, I think really kind of let her flourish in a way that she hadn't been able to for, for most of that time. She graduated in 1913 and then taught in Hurley, Wisconsin for a short time. But then she came back to Michigan and she got a, to a job teaching physics, so she had done some, some scientific work, physics coursework, um, and she got a job teaching physics at the College of the City of Detroit, as it was called at that time, which of course today is Wayne State University. So this was, <laughs> this was really unusual, okay? So she was sort of filling in for somebody who was sick, a kind of last minute, you know, substitution. Um, but she did, a, she did a good enough job to be invited back and eventually became the head of the department and then taught elsewhere in Detroit schools um, after that. Oh, sorry, whoops, this is, a, this is an image of her from the yearbook when she graduated from U of M. And the thing I wanna point out here, um, a couple students who are working with me at the Bentley helped me put together some of these images and, and we were commenting, again, think about that timeline, right? She looks, to me, very old-timey in this picture. This looks like from another era, right? But remember, she lived to 1975. Now, to some of you, that might seem like a long time ago, but it's really not that long ago. And she, she becomes kind of more modern, I think, as we trace her through time. So she, luckily for us, um, for pretty big stretches of her life, kept very voluminous diaries. And so this is an excerpt from um, one of her diary pages in 1922, and I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but I just did pull this one quote, education much, must teach men, by which I think, she meant you know, men and women, to think independently, to assemble the facts without prejudice, tradition, or self selfish considerations, and work out a logical conclusion for themselves. So what we would see today, I think, is very progressive. It's not about rote learning. This is really about kind of creative thinking. And I think we see that philosophy of hers through many, many things that she did. Now, um, go, I'm gonna go back in time a little bit now. In that, so she graduated in 1913, got that job teaching, is teaching in different capacities. Then in 1916, she got married. And she married a U of M engineering grad named Robert Lewis Goman. Her name had been Josephine Fellows. Now, what would this mean for her life, right? She's this ambitious young woman. She gets married. She says, just a couple years, she married in 1916. 1918, she says in her diary, I intended to enjoy a home and perform the duties of motherhood to be sure, but at the same time, I would follow the professional career that I had chosen. I would not degenerate into a domestic non-entity while my husband followed the primrose path to business success. Uh, the couple proceeded, or she had five children in quick succession, though which you know may perhaps slowed her down a little bit. But she did maintain involvement in activities beyond the home. Again, really unusual for this period, right? It's not that some women had careers in 1916. Married women were less likely to have a career in 1916. A married mother of five is very unlikely to have a career in 1916. But she's continuing to be involved outside the home. She wrote a newspaper column on children and education. Again, that philosophy I think is so important to keep in mind. Um, we know from her diaries that she attended many days of the sweet trial. And there is evidence that she um, helped connect Clarence Darrow to some African-American witnesses. So, so she's increasingly kind of plugged in in Detroit into things that are happening in Detroit. And one of the causes that she takes on is that of birth control. And the context of birth control in the early 20th century is really complicated, far beyond what I can do justice to tonight. But I want to give you some context. So at this time, early 20th century, it's illegal to send anything deemed obscene, which includes contraceptive information, through the mail. Um, but there's a growing campaign to provide information and practical help, and by that I mean birth control devices, to women through clinics. 
These campaigns are often spearheaded by elite women in different communities who had more time, money, and resources, and they are negotiating relationships with nurses and with physicians who are willing to provide this service to women, who are willing to become involved. And again, these images are not from Detroit, um, but I wanna just give you some context and a couple things to pay attention here, that this is very much in the context of family, okay? It's called family planning, usually. It's about maternal health. Rates of uh, maternal death in childbirth are pretty high compared at this time. Infant death is high, too, so it's kind of couched in health terms much more than sort of personal liberation or personal pleasure terms. This is, this is in public health terms, okay? Um, and especially for poor families who are often, the birth rate is very high among poor families. Now, Josephine Goman wrote in her own diary about this, about her own experience. She wanted a big family, but she was overwhelmed by the timing of one of her later pregnancies. So this is, this is close to home, okay, for her. She also was shaken by the death of two of her neighbors, very close friends of hers, in childbirth. So she becomes involved in the campaign in Detroit, and through the 1920s and 1930s, there were birth control clinics established in Detroit and also throughout Michigan, which really actually surprised me. So, I mean, throughout the state, Cadillac, Jackson, some in the Upper Peninsula, it wasn't just Detroit, Ann Arbor, Grand Rapids, the bigger cities. It was, it was really throughout. Now, Goman later recalled that they had to smuggle devices in from Canada, and she took a leadership role as I, as I may have said, eventually becoming president of the Detroit group. And she says every couple, she says here, this is years later, decades later, she's looking back and says every couple of weeks we would get raided. In those days you could go to jail for it. In Detroit, in 1927, a clinic was formed called the Mother's Clinic by a group of Jewish women. And this was probably the first clinic between New York and Chicago. And I want to quote from one of the early reports that this clinic sent back to kind of a, a larger umbrella group in New York City. Little was done in the way of public propaganda. For that type of social service, namely contraceptives, had not received the official blessing of the American Medical Association nor the sanction of the law. But little publicity was needed because its usefulness and timeliness was obvious to the socially minded. So in other words, we're not advertising that we're doing this, but the word's getting out, right? But think about that, what, what that means for the archival record, because there's not much paper generated. There's not much you know, physical evidence, that, documentary evidence that this clinic even existed. And that means that it's that much less likely for those records to have come down to the present for us to even sort of understand that landscape. So it's no accident that most of what we know about her involvement is what she herself is talking about decades later, when she's much older and when the landscape, the political landscape, is much different. Okay. She then runs in 1929 as a candidate for the school board in the city of Detroit. And I want you to note the gendered language here, right? A mother for the school board. And that list of her qualifications. Born and always lived in Michigan, graduate of the University of Michigan, two years engineering, former teacher, mother of five children in Detroit public schools. So it's this sort of multi, she's the whole package, right? She's got the professional skill and background, but she's also got that experience as a mother. Um, she did not win this campaign. But what she does next is that she helps her old friend Frank Murphy in his campaign for mayor. And he is elected mayor, and he appoints her as executive secretary. So sometimes she's referred to as a secretary, but she's, she's what we might call, and she was called at that time, executive secretary. She had a pretty big role. She was really kind of his advisor and chief of staff, I think is what we might call that today. But by now, we're in the Great Depression, and things are dire. Um, and, and I think what's hard to remember sometimes when we look back at something like this is that nobody knows when it's going to get better, right? They don't, they don't know. Um, so the federal government is not doing too much. Uh, President Herbert, Herbert Hoover does more than he gets credit for, I think, in my judgment. 
um, but he's really not meeting the scale of the crisis, and he doesn't think the federal government should expand its role any more than it's doing. And the, toward the, this is the latter part of his administration. But what this means is that there's room for cities, for municipalities to experiment. And Murphy and Goman really do this. So they do some, they, in Detroit, there are some incredibly innovative projects, which I think are fair to say become kind of prototypes for the New Deal. They're doing things that Hoover will not, and they're doing things that help then later inspire Roosevelt. And what they do, I think, can, can be divided into the information gathering. They're really trying to figure out what is the scale of the problem and how can we figure this out systematically. And then they're providing direct relief from the government. But they're often doing it in partnership with local business leaders. So the picture, so the picture on your right, you may have seen elsewhere, it's actually a fairly well-known image, I think, of the Great Depression, work is what I want and not charity. The image on the left, um, with the men sitting around the table, that is in a Fisher Brothers factory, and they allowed one of their factories to be used as a homeless men's lodge. The mayor's office and volunteers gathered up food from farmers markets in Detroit that, was, that would not sell. They'd go by at the end of the day, pick up the food that was there, and take it there, um, because farmers didn't want to take it home, and feed people one meal per day. And at the table, sitting on the right side, the second man in, that is Frank Murphy, the mayor of Detroit. The mayor's office also established the Mayor's Unemployment Commission. And again, this is a lot of information gathering, and Josephine Goman is in, is in charge of this. So they do a big registration drive to determine the scope of the problem. What is going on specifically for Detroit families? What do they need? They also created a job bureau. And Goman said later, again, this bureau was manned by experienced people who had been heads of employment, agents and employment agencies and factories. And they did what they could to mobilize whatever jobs there were. So remember, the city of Detroit had been booming uh, before, prior to this, so there had been kind of a lot of energy, there's a lot of expertise to kind of connect the dots. And so that's what, that's what the mayor's office is trying to kind of leverage that to say, we got to figure out what's happening and we have to figure out what jobs might be available and connect people to those jobs. The city itself also asked each department to hire as many men as possible and it paid them to the amount of their relief checks. So in other words, if you were getting a certain amount of money in relief and direct aid from the government, you would come work for the city for a certain number of hours to earn that check. And Goman said, this fostered the psychological health of the men. This is still, <laughs> this is primarily men, breadwinners, heads of families is how this was structured. But it's, it's, she's very attuned to kind of what it feels like to be on relief and trying to alleviate that by saying, no, you're working for the city and then you get this check. 12,000 people went to work for the city of Detroit under this program. And she said decades later, and I would absolutely agree, in every essential, this was the plan that Harry Hopkins copied when he started the Works Project Administration under the New Deal at the federal, at the federal level. Um, one other program that I'll just mention quickly was the Thrift Garden Project, where the, um, again, the mayor's office, and Goman was very involved, identified vacant property in the city, contacted owners about putting it under cultivation, registered people who wanted a garden, had them take courses at Cass Tech in how to do this, and then it, it was very structured. So you were checked up on, and if you weren't maintaining your garden, then you might be off the list, and the next person in line might have that opportunity. She said, we produced a million dollars worth of food this way, okay? And so it's the city that's kind of doing this, but Ford, trucks from Ford Motor Company were used sometimes to move the produce and to, um, they even started some canning projects and again, involved trucks from Ford Motor. So that's what I meant when I said, this is direct relief from the government, but they're also partnering with business leaders throughout Southeast Michigan. So even then when, um, 
Gaumont started to work for Frank Murphy as the mayor. Now remember I said they met, probably, they might have met at mass. Frank Murphy is a devout Catholic. She, she says that she kept her ties with the birth control program, the birth control movement. And at that time, it was not uncommon if you were going to go to a doctor, you had to have a card that said you were a married woman. You had to, you know, say you were married. So she says she kept in her desk, in the mayor's office, these cards, and she would, you know, hand them out if needed. She said that Murphy eventually just laughed about it, but then one day, Father Charles Coughlin, the radio priest, came by, and he... Uh, wanted to arrest her, but she says everybody just sort of laughed and eventually they shooed him out. Now, I have a hard time believing this story, actually, or that this was literally true. This, again, is one of these that she's recounting now in the 1960s when she's much, much older. But I think, as, as is not uncommon sometimes, these anecdotes can kind of illuminate a larger truth because I think the through line of her career really is evident there, that she whether those literal conversations ever happened or not, she got herself into positions of influence, even positions of power, and then she pushed change kind of from inside these systems. I think that was her MO. So things are going along. She's working with the mayor very closely. And then in 1933, Franklin Roosevelt becomes a president. Franklin Roosevelt has his eye on Frank Murphy. Franklin Roosevelt says to Frank Murphy, how would you like to be governor general of the Philippines? And so he goes to the Philippines, and she no longer has her kind of office in the city of Detroit. So she runs for the Common Council, which was then the name of the Detroit City Council. Remember, she's run for the school board, now she's running for the city council. She is endorsed by a number of African-American groups, including John Dancy of the Detroit Urban League, who had served on the, the mayor's unemployment commission with her. Once again, she does not win. But she's again kind of raising her profile even by running. Um, she then though is named the housing director for the city by the new mayor named John Smith. Now, does anybody recognize the woman with her? Okay, call it out for me. Who is it? Eleanor Roosevelt, that's right. Um, so Detroit's public housing program was one of the first to be created in the United States during the New Deal. And Gohan, again, is put in charge of this. Now, she's not an obvious choice by any measure. She didn't have a background in planning or housing. She was a woman. Um, but she did have some interesting qualifications, including she has a number of contacts in the mayor's office and also in Washington, D.C., now, this situation was a big challenge, kind of like with the, with the Great Depression and those commissions. They're kind of creating it as they go. You know, what is this going to look like? What is this going to be? It's not even clear initially that she's going to get paid in this job, although ultimately she does. She had a very ambitious vision. She wanted to do more than housing. She was really thinking about land use planning, and she wanted to re-envision all of the 17 square miles that were within Grand Boulevard in the city of Detroit. She wanted to clear slums and modernize housing, but also have programs in place that would prevent slums from forming again. She promoted civil rights. Um, she, she participated in multiracial conferences throughout the 1930s. She, she supported black employment in the housing program itself. She hired a black secretary. She looked for black architects and black draftsmen. Um, she hired black staff to help with the relocation of African-American families. She thought they could more be, probably better connect with community needs. Black families who were relocated as part of these public housing campaigns were supposed to go to another neighborhood that was already majority black. This was federal policy that it be done this way, but she added the provision that the houses that they went to had to be as good or better than they left, than those they left behind. Now that's honored maybe more, you know, whatever that phrase is, that she couldn't always deliver on that, but at least articulated that that should be a goal. Now this picture here is um, when Eleanor Roosevelt came for the beginning of the Brewster Housing Project. And this was new buildings to be built. Um, blacks and liberal whites wanted it to be racially integrated. White business leaders wanted it to be whites only. She is its in a dilemma. It's not clear what can even be done. 
She wanted it to be integrated, but she ultimately decided to call together black leaders and said it would have to be segregated for blacks or she felt blacks would not get any housing as part of this project. So it's kind of a bitter compromise, um, but this was consistent with national trends. So again, this photo is of Eleanor Roosevelt who came for the groundbreaking. The Brewster projects were built as a series of low rise buildings around courtyards, opened in 1938 with 701 units. Um, Motown artists such as Diana Ross lived there as, ch as children. The comedian Lily Tomlin also lived there as a little girl. Um, and these, these buildings then were torn down in the 1990s, so that their arc is not that long. Um, so this is very, con all of this politics of housing is very contentious as you can imagine. There's protests against these developments. The black community, some feel that she's betrayed them. Even those who support her can't, they don't have enough political clout to really protect her. In 1938, um, so then there's a rapid turnover in the Detroit mayors during this period. And then in 1938, three disgruntled members of the Housing Commission declared her position vacant. She's still there, but they somehow, in kind of a parliamentary move, say it's vacant, um, effectively firing her. It, there also was, at this time, a shift to kind of a more scientific planning. The fact that she did not have a background in this and a credential starts to hurt her. And again, probably the fact that she was a woman and part of the reason I think that's a pretty safe bet is that after she's removed from the position and the Brewster houses get built, there is an advertisement for people to take the civil service exam to become manager of the Brewster projects, but guess what? You have to be a man to even take the exam. And so some people think this is an attempt to keep her, you know, make sure that she's not gonna get that job, right? So once again, when she's out of this kind of administrative position, she runs for office again. She runs for the Common Council. Um, again, she is not elected, but this is one of her campaign materials and a very robust endorsement from African Americans and other ethnic groups. So she, after this election, she still is working. She does some work in the court system and then World War II happens. So how many of you have been to Willow Run or are familiar with Willow Run? So the Ford Motor Company is contracted to make B-24 Liberator bombers. As you may know then, it's a, it's a real technological challenge. They know how to build cars. They don't know how to build planes. Um, I'll just run through a couple images that are from the Library of Congress that I think really kind of evoke this and the scale of this, right? I think by the end of the war, one was coming off the line every 73 minutes or something like that. Don't quote me on that. But I mean, it's scaled up very fast um, at, at with a lot of urgency and intensity. And there aren't enough people to, to do this work. It's pretty intensive work. And so... Um, Women enter the labor force, people from other parts of the United States come to enter the labor force, people who had not been allowed to have high paying manufacturing jobs like this before are coming to the Detroit area to get this kind of, to get this kind of work. So there's technical challenges, but there's also what we might call sociological challenges. Who's gonna do it? Where are they gonna live? How are they gonna even eat? How are we gonna manage these shifts? How are they gonna get along, okay? Um, so there's problems of absenteeism, there's problems of, uh, again, fears of conflict of people coming, there's a real housing crisis, like where will they live, right? So these shacks go up in, in Willow Run, um, campers, trailers, people are doubling up, tripling up, people are um, sometimes, you know, if you're working, if there are three shifts in the factories, there's three shifts in the boarding house. So three different people are gonna sleep in one bed over the course of 24 hours. So it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's a lot of people in a, really, in a really compressed place, right? Now, it's very conventional thinking at that time that if you got a lot of women together, you need a woman in charge, right? The U of M had a dean of women at that time for the same mindset, right? So um, they've got all this going on at Willow Run, and 
who, who's going to be in charge of these special needs or special issues that women are believed to have and to some degree actually did have. So Josephine Gaumont gets put in charge of women personnel at Willow Run. And she, this time I would say, is eminently qualified, right? Because she's got all this work in the mayor's office dealing with the effects of the Great Depression. She has the, her experience at the Detroit with the Detroit Housing Commission, she, there she administered a budget of $12 million. Okay, so she has done things at scale. She has done some pretty big projects. She's got a lot of familiarity with Washington, D.C. Um, in her role as housing director, she had gone back and forth to Washington a number of times, and she said with some confidence, oh, it was very easy to always get to the right person without too much trouble, <laughs> right? So she's, again, pretty plugged in, in Detroit and now nationally, too. She said, at, when she was offered the job, and then later too, she, would, she said this repeatedly, that she, at first she didn't want it. She, didn't, she did not want it. And she, she said, I was sorry, but I just could not work for the Ford, Ford Motor Company. It would be a great embarrassment to you, I said to Mr. Ford. And the implication here is that she doesn't agree with him, he knows this, and she won't be able to keep her mouth shut, kind of. She won't be able to toe the line. Harry Bennett, who's kind of Ford's right-hand man, said, this is, her, again, her recounting it later. Mr. Ford and I talked this over yesterday. You're it. There isn't anyone else. And we're not going to have some woman the government sends in. So, like, you're a known quantity. Let's, let's do this thing, okay? Um, but as with other jobs she took, she really had to define it as she went. So at the moment that she gets the job, again, this is, you know, a kind of perilous moment in American morale, right? So there's a lot of kind of upbeat talk. When she gets the position, she says, there's no question that this will be one of the most interesting and constructive jobs I could contribute to the war effort. I feel there is a great need for such work. This is a new era of labor relations for women. She was supposed to shoulder the economic troubles of women employees and counsel them in her personal problems. She will interview them all and match them to the best job. This is how this was described. Privately, she wrote to her daughter, after, now you know, a young adult daughter, after the first day. She says, it's a new job and nobody knows what to do with me. The officials are all so polite but completely at sea. They have trotted me around all day until I am totally exhausted. She didn't even have an office. She's trying to scrounge up a table and chair. She finally gets a typewriter. She's afraid that somebody will take the typewriter. So when she goes home the first day, she puts a sign on her door that says women's restroom. So none of the guys will go in and take her typewriter, okay? But as she had done in the mayor's office, her first step is, is to try to get a handle on the situation and the same kind of information gathering, the same kind of, kind of surveys and, and really just trying to talk to the people about what, what is really going on. There was also a lot of attention to safety and training. You're probably familiar with the Rosie the Riveter. You know, that's, a, that's real, right? This, these women were working in factories. Um, and there was a lot of debate nationwide. Can women even do this kind of work? So if you've ever seen some of the training Films, they're just, they're, you know, riveting is just like sewing. You know, if you know how to do this, you can, you can do this. Um, there was particular concern about women's attire and women's comportment. How will they behave? You know, can they, can they take it? There was a card in Goman's papers that said additional safety rules for women, for women, no rings or watches, wear low heeled shoes only and no cuffs on slacks. And part of this is genuine concern that like things will get stuck in these machines and you can really, you know, get hurt. Um, there was a, a movie star at that time named Veronica Lake who had this very, picture this only way more glamorous, kind of this big swoop of hair, you know? And people tried to get her to change that hairstyle because it was influencing women. And man, if you got that stuck in some kind of machine, that would be really bad news. So, so Goldman's trying to kind of police all of these things. Um, but one of the most important issues she had to deal with was that of maternity and child care, right? And at, when she came to Willow Run, there was no maternity policy, and women would simply try to hide their pregnancies and just keep working because they didn't want to get fired. They didn't want to lose their job. So she worked to create a policy that included prenatal care 
and then kind of would match tasks to the woman's actual, you know, health and, and ability at, at that point in the pregnancy. She also refers in a letter to her children in December of 1942 to previewing a film that Mrs. Ford wants to show at Willow Run. Now, I don't know if this is Clara Ford, Henry's wife, or Eleanor Ford, Edsel's wife, but it shows they were involved as well, right, whichever Mrs. Ford it is. But Goldman says this is a very good film and an excellent way of getting it across to the workers that we are interested in the care of children. She says a million dollars has been appropriated for nursing schools in this area. Now, I'm betting that a million dollars is from the federal government. That's not from Ford Motor alone. She says, at the present time, no worker will ask for assistance in taking care of children because she is afraid that she will lose her job if she is needed at home. All the complaints we get come through the back door. Some neighbor complains that children are being neglected. So this is a real dilemma, right? And she's working hard to, um, to try to resolve that. And she, she and her team put together nurseries for, kid, for you know, young children at different parts around the complex. She was also, as she had been earlier in her career, very attuned to issues of race at Willow Run. And this is partly why she thought Ford would not, she and, and Ford would butt heads, which they kind of did. Um, but all of this is in the context of evolving federal policy. You may have heard of, even if you don't know the name of it, Executive Order 8802, which banned racial discrimination, um, banned discriminatory employment practices by federal agents, by unions and by any companies getting a federal contract. So at this point, the military itself is still racially segregated, but this executive order says if you're doing business with the federal government, you cannot practice racial discrimination. So she set four preconditions for black employment at Willow Run. She said every qualified worker should be considered for clerical and final inspection jobs. There should be no Jim Crow departments, no departments that are only blacks or whites, no black maintenance workers. And the reason she wanted this was that a lot of other companies would hire a few black custodians and say, hey, we're good, you know, we're, follow we're following the rules. And she also said there will be no segregation of lunchrooms. So she, again, she didn't always succeed, um, but these were her priorities coming in. Now. In the, in the post-World War II era, so we, again, we got these sort of chapters, right? With Murphy as mayor, Detroit Housing Commission, Willow Run. Then after the war, she didn't have as prominent of a position in any one place. Um, she continued to be involved in many causes as a private citizen. She was involved in some campaigns for judges. She worked in the court system. She had a radio program that I would really love to find any recordings of that. Um, she worked a lot with the ACLU and she worked with the NAACP. She got many, many awards and accolades in, later in her life. She got an honorary degree from Wayne State. Um, this is her, she's being fed it, fed it at a big ACLU dinner. Um, this one though, I'll pause for a second. So big profile. Look at that headline, Detroit history through the eyes of one Joe Goman, recalling the legendary Murphy, Bennett, and Ford. The implication that she's not legendary, right, but she was there, she was kind of a witness to history. Well, I'm saying she herself was a history maker, okay? Just again to show how, how widely known she was at one time, right? All of these different awards. Now, this brings us back to the Bentley. So just as she did her work by establishing relationships, so too her papers came to the Bentley through networks. So she was very encouraged by people she had worked with over the years, including some pretty prominent politicians, to donate her papers. You matter, your, stories, your story matters, this material is important, I just gave my papers to the Bentley, why don't you do the same? Now it took her a little while since she planned to do some writing herself and she wanted to keep them handy for that. This is not uncommon for donors. Sometimes they think maybe eventually they will, but they're not ready yet. Um, but eventually she did establish a collection not too long before she died and then her family members added to it 
later. So if you enter her name in the catalog, this is what you will see. So a little bit of description of her, a summary of the collection. As I mentioned, she has diaries. She wrote a lot of letters to her kids, especially. Um, this is really helpful for us, right? Because some of those quotations I read was her sort of recounting her day for her children. Um, and then this, the interface actually looks a little bit different now, but this is the way you can see more information about the collection in what we call the finding aid. And this is what Bentley Archivist put together to describe the collection and give some information about the person or the organization and then provide a kind of inventory. And so you can see down the left-hand side, that left column is kind of the types of materials and those are all live links. So these are all ways that um, you as a researcher or user can learn more about her. Um, this is kind of the point of entry to learning more about her materials. And there she is. I always feel a little bit morbid saying that because that's not, you know, that's paper, okay? Um, but that is really genuinely how I think about it, that this, this, is, her, this is her story is, is in these boxes. So her collection is 10 linear feet. As I said, we measure in, in linear feet, so that's just one, one portion of it. I want to also note, though, that is when we look at a historical figure like this to try to tell their story, we also want to tell it in context. So we have the, we, her collection is at the Bentley. There are also papers about early efforts toward birth control at the Bentley. That's where I learned some of that about where some of the other clinics are. There are also materials related to Willow Run. So it's a kind of, you know, you might start with a person, but you want to learn about their universe, and so you're looking at other kinds of materials, too. Um, when she died in 1975, Coleman Young, then the mayor of Detroit, said, we take for granted today many of the things she fought for every day of her life. So again, a, a big range of causes, networks. She's important because of who she worked with, but she's also important for her own sake. And I want to just end by saying, by asking a question, kind of, who, who is the Josephine Goman of today? Who is out there making history? It, it doesn't have to be somebody famous, right? And I ask you to consider, could it, could it be you? Could it be somebody that you know about? And um, I have some materials here for those of you in the room. I hope you'll look at them at the, at the end that describe kind of what we do in collecting at the Bentley and um, my business card. And if you know of a story or you yourself have material, I am always happy to hear about that. So thank you very much. Michelle, thank you, thank you so much for that, that really, really rich uh, presentation uh, about a really rich life, obviously, of, the, of, uh, of, 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 of uh, Josephine Goman. I, I want to, you know, there's so much that we could get into, so much detail. We, we can't possibly, you know, cover all of this again. And, I'm, and I also have the feeling that you, you were just really scratching the surface with a lot of this. But maybe we can, maybe we can tease out a few things um, that you already started in the talk. Uh, one thing, I just wanted to start with one observation, which is that during this period, I mean, the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, Detroit is really a world-class city in a way that I don't think we can really understand today. Not, it's just not in the same way today. And so she's at the center of one of the world's great cities at that time. And the, so the influence is so, so I mean, her, her ability to maneuver in that kind of an environment is really, uh, is really striking. And I, I was struck, I mean, obviously she was tremendous at building relationships. Uh, and with very disparate people with conflicting uh, ideas and, and goals and so forth. And you talked about Willow Run and, and Ford and Bennett, uh, you know, <laughs> saying, we don't care if you, you know, what you're going to say, we're going to take you on anyway. 
And one of the things that you had sent me before indicated that so a few years before that, she's also advising Walter Ruther mm -hmm. as he's forming the, the UAW. Uh, and then Frank Murphy is negotiating the, the first sit-down strike with GM, and, and Bennett is out there then later cracking heads, you know, and right. so forth. And somehow uh, she, she manages to work with all of these people and push. So I just wonder if you could elaborate, say a little bit more about that. I mean, what, what, what was it about her that, uh, that you think, I mean, or any, any indications from her diaries or from her letters that, that give you some sense of where she got this, this sort of strength and solidity? So that, that's a really good question. I mean, I think, so, and yes, I'd like to go a lot, I would like to have done more research before I really answer that question, but I'll answer it. So I think some of it had to be just kind of who she was, right? A kind of temperamental, that she could, she could take it, kind of. She, she could handle being direct and a certain degree of conflict, although she does write in her diaries as anyone would, like, you know, I'm exhausted, this is so hard, this is so frustrating. Um, I also think it's, it's partly her, that, that her, <laughs> her gender in a way protects her because she, so she doesn't rise all the way to the top in anything as she might have, right? So she's the assistant to the, to the mayor. She gets squeezed out of the housing position. She's the director of women personnel at Willow Run, but nobody's going to put her in charge of the whole thing. And I, I think that. I'm not saying that was a better system because I do not believe that, but what I do think is that that, that inoculated her. She, I think you wouldn't think she could surprise people because she, she keeps working to some degree with the same people, but I think they, it, it, there was a way in which probably she was sort of sneaking up on people, and I don't mean that in a malicious, but just like, there, oh, there she is again. Like even Bennett's saying, like, who else is it going to be? It's going to be you. We don't want somebody we don't know from the government. Mm -hmm. But you're right about the, some of that, the labor, that, that really is a surprise, that she, could, that, that she could be in these positions with people who were really at odds, and I guess we must conclude in a way that she didn't betray people, right? That she didn't say things behind others' backs because they continued to trust her even if she, even if they wouldn't, yeah. She, she couldn't keep doing it if she started to betray people mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. then, then they wouldn't allow her back in the ring, so to right, speak. Right, right. You can also get the sense, or it seems to me, that she, she was a person of tremendous compassion and ability mm -hmm. to listen. I mean, uh, you had mentioned how she, I mean, she put herself in the position of these people who might be receiving aid mm -hmm. or might be mm -hmm. in, in, in other situations. So. Right, and I think, it's, I think it's a particular moment kind of in, in professionalism or professionalization that she, you know, she doesn't have an advanced degree. She's not a specialist in any one of these things, but she's clearly a, a very, very gifted person, quick learner, very, um, had a lot of, I think, um, she's very nimble, right, mm -hmm. to be able mm -hmm. to negotiate all these things. And, and so she could also operate in these different domains, whereas today, you probably could not be that much of a generalist, mm -hmm. kind of, mm -hmm. as she was. Right. Right. Uh, another theme, that uh, she seems to have taken a very systemic approach to so many of these projects. I mean, you mentioned in the, uh, uh, in the Murphy administration, in the early days of the, of the Great Depression, uh, this, this sort of systematic uh, thinking about things. And with the Housing Commission, how, I mean, she doesn't want to just do housing. She's basically doing urban planning on a, on a, on a broad scale. And any reflections about that? You know, she, I was thinking about that too, it was maybe with slightly different words. Like she, she feels like she's of the progressive era to me, like, the, the mm. er, like earlier in the 20th century in a way. And again, this kind of being a generalist, not so much a credentialed specialist that comes later, but so much faith that if we can just learn about the problem and apply our energy, we can solve it. I mean, she really seems to believe that. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that's what's animating all of that information gathering. And then as you say, what that lends itself to is like 
a kind of systematic way of, of thinking, that these are not isolated problems. We want to think broadly. We, get, we gather the data, think broadly, and apply a solution, mm -hmm. which is easier said than done, right. of course, right? right. But, right. And she was remarkably successful yes, in so was. many ways, despite mm -hmm. a lot of those barriers that you were uh, that you were talking about. I, I had a specific question about the uh, the Sweet trial and uh, Darrow and so forth. So she was a did she have any official capacity? Was she there as a, I mean she she was just attending the trial or was she? That's yeah, that's a good question. Um, as far as I know, she did not have any official role there. And that's that, to me, in a way, is the beginning of her, the, the first time it, that I know in the chronology that she just kind of invents herself, in a way, as a, as a necessary agent here. So she, she, she's going, I mean, she, so she knows Murphy, who's the judge. But as far as I know, he, it's not like he's tapping her. Mm -hmm, she mm -hmm. does get to know Clarence Darrow pretty well, it seems. Um, he apparently, the, the, part of this is from Kevin Boyle's reading of the diaries. Darrow seems to take a fancy to her. And um, I don't know where she gets the energy either because, like, they're sitting in court all day and then they're going out to a restaurant and then, you know, she's getting home in the middle of the night and she's still got these young kids and then she gets up the next day and does the whole thing all over again. Well, she learned it from the switchboard. Order. I guess so. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and, and she and she helped uh, she helped recruit, uh, or it sounds like she she mm -hmm. connected him to uh, to African American witnesses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she clearly was already connected to right. the African American community. Do you know where how that was so? Or I think so. So as I said about the the birth control stuff, right? That a lot of these causes they there are kind of elite women involved, and then there's much, you know poor people or people in much dire straits who need those services. And she's kind of in between, you know, her, her husband's, they're, they're working their way up to what I might call kind of lower middle class at that point, but still not a huge amount of stability and her background is not of that elite group. Mm -hmm. So I think it's partly through the, the, the teaching and the, the, um, you know, some of the birth control that she's maybe involved in, the different causes that she's involved in, that's starting to get her connected in those in those ways. And probably, you know, she's got what we were talking about before. There's something about her that people let her in, mm -hmm. right? So if she's, she may have been more successful than others. I mean, Daryl's kind of, you know, they drop him in to do this. It's not like right. he's from Detroit, right? Right, right? So there's the NAACP on the ground, the Detroit chapter. Um, I'm guessing it's sort of through that as well that she's mm -hmm. so she's probably not the only one who's mm -hmm. doing this right, right? but she right. she's doing it enough to kind of get credit later so mm -hmm. she she's successful right in it. right so I want to open it up to the audience in just a moment but one more question first and that is um, any particular anecdote or or something from the diaries or her letters that you didn't touch on that you uh, that you that you're maybe struck by or A good question. Nothing, nothing comes okay, to mind. I, but I, I think her voice. I mean, she has a very, very lively voice, yeah. and it, and it. She sounds like somebody you'd want to talk to. Mm -hmm. Well, and she, did, she, she was a columnist. I mean, yes, she, right. She, and, and yeah, yeah, that's 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 great. Okay, so uh, for the the people here, uh, you know, raise your hand. Please wait for the microphone because we want to capture it. We want to make sure it gets onto the uh, onto the recording. And Andrew is going to be monitoring uh, the YouTube chat. So if you're on YouTube and you have a question, please put it in the chat, and he'll convey it. Um, it that was fantastic. It was she's a fascinating person. You did a great job of illuminating her life. Um, I wondered if there are more things that you can say, again, from her letters and diaries. I mean, I cannot believe how often she had to reinvent herself because she was just, you know, cast aside. And does she address any of that? What was that like? I mean, it, it's amazing to me that she just kept going. Yeah, so I think my sense, right, so I, pre I presented it, I put these... I periodized her life, right? I said there was this, and then there was this, and then there was this. In her, in the her materials, it's as as maybe it does for many of us. It just it sounds steadier, 
you know. So yes, she's up, yes, she's down, but sometimes that's because something happened to one of, with one of her children or, or something else. It's not like she's saying, oh my gosh, now I lost this job and what am I going to do next? So I think that maybe that's part of her resilience that she just, she's had to be self-sufficient most of her life, even in the marriage from what I can tell or pretty soon on, she's, you know, she's carrying a lot. And I think she just thought that's the way it is. My head's off to her. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Did Josephine have any brothers or sisters? She, no, she was an only child. She's only child. Mm -hmm. And one funny fact: my mother would feed me mayonnaise and peanut butter sandwiches that she claimed were the fad during the Great Depression. Was that true? Because <laughs> um, uh, that could during during the what the Great Depression, right? So oh, my I mother would be like, of, "Here, buddy, go yes. with your white bread, Miracle Whip, and peanut butter." I'm, and I was like, "Ma, you know what? I don't know about that." I'm not I, sure about the Miracle Whip per se, but I, yes, I think that that anything anything to kind of stretch the food, yeah. right? So anything with a little bit of flavor that you could okay. put on that bread and. I've also heard depression crackers are graham crackers with just a little bit of icing. I'm sorry, depression cookies with a little bit of icing oh. in the graham crackers. Okay, cool. I caught a lot of flack in, in, at lunchtime, so <laughs> thanks. But I'm, I'm glad you asked that question about siblings because I think that's part of, we don't know very much about her family of origin. Her father was, was older um, and not in great health and may have even been institutionalized. And so she really did not have that support system either, which I think maybe led to this resilience and self-sufficiency that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Andrew has an online question. Um, Patty asks, um, you mentioned a program that employed about 12,000 people that the, w, the Works Progress Administration was based on. Uh, what was the name of that? She'd love to read more about it. So that was, so the, the question was the, pro, the program that, that um, employed people in the city of Detroit, I believe, it was, oh right, that was called the wage work plan under the mayor's unemployment, I guess I should look here, under the uh, mayor's unemployment <laughs> commission. Another one? Yeah, go ahead. Um, another question is, um, how supportive was her husband, or what was that relationship like when she was moving between all these different positions all around Detroit and Michigan? So what was her relationship with her husband? So I, I wish, so really I'm at the beginning stages of this research and I have not dug in fully to the diaries or the, or the letters. Um, but so I, I don't, I still don't know a, a whole lot about that, about their relationship. We know that she says early in the marriage that she you know, she's determined to be her own person. She's getting married, but she wants to have her own path or her own career. Um, there's, there are times also when early on that she's making a lot more money than he is, but she's the one having the babies. And so she winds up stepping back from work and that adds to their economic, you know, challenge. Um, later on, we, I, I have yet to see evidence that she felt he prevented her from doing anything how supportive he really was, we don't, we don't know. And he died, I wanna say 1948, maybe, but by the late 1940s, I believe he's deceased. So she has a, almost 30 years of, of widowhood too. Oh, great. Marianne, Marianne asks, um, can you speak a little more about Gorman's connection, if any, with Eleanor Roosevelt? So her connection with Eleanor Roosevelt. So um, that's another one I don't know for sure. I mean, she's her, so she's compared to her. She's Michigan's Eleanor Roosevelt, or talked about in that way, which I, she's not the wife of any big politician, right? But I think has that similar, she's not quite the main actor, but she's the most important supporting cast member, kind of, is how this is all structured, right? Um, I believe, and I didn't refresh, they didn't review this part, so I'm not 100% certain, but I, I believe that one of Eleanor Roosevelt's brothers was in Detroit for either during the New Deal era and or during World War II. Um, like that was his job. He was overseeing some governmental stuff in Detroit for a period of time and that 
she got to know him quite well, and that was another entree into the into the really the highest levels. So, uh, with Josephine's long life, like full of so many different legacies, did you come across any of her diaries or anything that she said that? maybe she considered one like the most important to her or something that she would put, you know, put the top, the top of her list, like something that was most important to her through her time. So that's a great question. Did she identify anything as her most important legacy? No. And I, again, not that I have seen yet. Um, I mean, she might say her children and grandchildren in a way, but I think, you know, part of the reason I put all those different, dinners and, and um, you know, honorary degrees and all that. It was to, to show kind of the breadth. And I think that too is part of what made her so remarkable that it's, it's, it's like a who's who of Detroit progressive causes, you know? So I think she, she really, she might, I don't know what she would say, I guess. I shouldn't say that. But certainly others pointed to kind of the, the ACLU and the NAACP were the, the organizations that she had the longest involvement with. In some ways, the, the organizations that she really maybe was most aligned with, and they too are somewhat multifaceted, right? So no accident there. So a kind of um, just social justice writ large, I think, is is what I see. But that's a really good question. I, I will think about that more as I go back to the materials for sure. Um, so a question I have, again, it might be one that you don't know the answer to yet, but it sounds like she met Frank Murphy while a student at U of M. Do you have any sense of, was she making some of these other connections that became so pivotal, pivotal in her later life while she was here as a student? So the question, if she, she met Frank, we believe at least, and I'm, I'm pretty sure, she met Frank Murphy as a student. Did she meet others um, during that time in her life? I don't believe so. For some people, that is the trajectory, right? That's where you're creating those networks. But for her, except for him, and if you know, if he hadn't become who he became, then she might. We might say she sort of started when she started teaching at Wayne and became more centered in Detroit. But because of him, we we would tra we, you know we trace it earlier. But I th and I think it's partly because of just what her college experience was like, that she didn't have the opportunity to really build those networks at that time. Do we know who the English uh, English professor was who sort of helped her with the... We do. I can't come up with the okay, name right now. Okay. But, but that gives me the opportunity to say, so um, a, a professor at U of M Dearborn named Liz Rohan, a professor of rhetoric, reached out to me. She has begun investigating um, Josephine Goman too, and she constant. She has an article that's just coming out, um, and my card is here. If somebody wants to follow up on that, I don't have that citation at my fingertips. But if you contact me, I can I can um, get that for you. Where she really concentrates on Josephine's period in, in college and probes this kind of what did it mean to be in college, but really be kind of an outsider and not have the resources to do that that full experience. And she talks about that that kind of last semester launch kind of and, and what a difference that that could have made but at the same time we don't you know to what extent did that did did the challenges she faced as a student give her as you said that empathy mm -hmm. later that she could bring to these different efforts and campaigns other questions do you mind saying just a little bit about your current work as a field archivist um, I mean what are the challenges that you face in, in this day and age in, in, in helping us, you know, in the future uh, know more about this past when it's past? So sure, I'm, I'm always happy to talk about my work as a field archivist. So, so as I said before, um, the Bentley collects material related to the history of the university, but I collect about the history of the, of the state of Michigan, other things that happen in the state beyond the university. And I have, a, as probably as evident, I have a longstanding interest in women's history. So I'm very much interested in collecting materials related to women's history. In my experience, um, many women think that they're, they're not important enough, or their story doesn't matter, or or, as we see with her too, 
women's lives may be so kind of episodic that it's not clear, oh, that was my capital C career, that was my, you know, that was my contribution. Um, it's more diffuse, and, and that is a challenge to say, well, then what are the records? What are the materials that can help, you know, that we want to, that we want to preserve? Um, there's even also still some challenges with kind of tracing women because of issues with names and so on. So change your name at marriage and then it's hard to figure out, is that the same person, you know? Um, so there, there's, there's some of that. I'm also, a long standing strength of the Bentley is collecting in political history and we're very much trying to continue that. I, I think partly because of my background in history, I'm trying to think as broadly as possible about what politics means. Um, look at her, she ran for election three times but lost every time. Does that mean this isn't, doesn't have something to say about political history? Absolutely not. I think this illuminates key themes in 20th century political history. So we're trying to think as broadly as possible, but there too, it's, it's, <laughs> It's harder to identify and gather the material, right? A governor or a mayor, they have an office, that office makes paper that usually has a staff that's keeping track of the paper and organizing the paper. Somebody like this, who's more like a freelancer in a way, right? Where are those materials going to be? Um, how do we capture them and preserve them? And that's to say nothing of the challenges of electronic communication, right, which are tend to be or can be much more ephemeral and also kind of separated. So the models for, for how we collect material don't always keep up with how people are actually making stuff today. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's a challenge. So both kind of a conceptual, almost psychological challenge, like yes, you matter, we want this story and a kind of technical, where is it, like what's the stuff, you know, that, that we can capture. The papers that were, are in her collection, are they her diaries? Are they related to her work at these different areas? I mean, what's in there? Just what you're saying made me kind of think about that. Yeah, so the, the, I'm just going to repeat the question for the people at home. Um, what are the materials that are in, in her collection? Yes, it's mostly what, what we would call her personal papers, right? So it's the diary, and again, thank goodness that she was this very disciplined diary writer. Her correspondence, thank goodness, she seems to have made carbons and kept them for a lot of her letters and or her kids kept them. So there, that's been, we have a pretty good record of her correspondence. Um, she herself gathered some material because she wanted to write a biography of Henry Ford and one of Harry Bennett, which she never did. Um, and that's part of the reason she didn't want to give it. So she, but she um, collected that material. There's some clippings, there's some, so all of those things of her awards and everything that came from her collection. So she, she kept that kind of stuff toward the end of her life. But there's, there's very little, except for a few obscure diary entries about, say, her involvement in, in the birth control movement at the time. And then later in the, in, the 70, in the 60s and 70s, when she's being interviewed, hitting these milestone birthdays and things like that, then that's when she's saying, oh, well, you know, we were smuggling them in from Canada and we could have been arrested and stuff, which I, I think has maybe a little bit of exaggerate but there's some mythology attached to her too and believe me i am sucked right into it because i think she's amazing um but but that i mean that i don't know if you meant me to get to this point but it's an important point to make that some of what we know is from materials generated at the time and then some is just in retrospect right um and we have to balance those against it but no it's not what we would consider the kind of organizational papers of here's the detroit housing commission and here's her because she you know, they squeezed her out. She, she, and she shouldn't have kept that even if she could because that belongs to the, the city government. Um, so th that's another challenge that people are sort of adjacent, especially women, maybe adjacent to these things, but they're not, they don't have control over the material. Okay. Well, Michelle, thank you so much. Oh, my this, pleasure. This is a great presentation and a great discussion. Thank you to the audiences, appreciate you.
Uh, our next Making Michigan will be October 19th and is titled More Than First Do No Harm, Modeling Global Engagement with the U of M Ghana Partnership. And the speaker is going to be Tim Johnson, who was really the primary architect of that now 30-year-old uh, collaboration. Uh, thanks to Andrew Rutledge for monitoring YouTube and to the Michigan media team. I want to remind you we're open Friday afternoons. We have walking tours most Friday afternoons. If you're here in the uh, audience, the observatory upstairs is open until 9 o'clock, and we'll have docents up there ready to help you uh, out. This session will be available on YouTube in about a week. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you again all for coming. Until we see you all again, uh, please be safe, stay well, and keep hope. And good night. Thank you. Thank you.